A fulfilling life involves connecting with others, family, associates, children, parents, employees, and friends. Whether through collaboration in work, cohabitation, or leisure time spent together, nurturing relationships necessitates assuming responsibility for them. Take bosses for instance. How many bosses do you know that would be totally lost without their secretary? Quite a few. They're a team. One takes the spotlight. The other is invaluable behind the scenes. One's a great idea person. The other a great detailed person. They work together or it wouldn't work at all. Of course, you need to be responsible for yourself and to yourself before you can be responsible to another person. You need to be the best you can be so that you can bring your absolute best to any relationship. And that's the tie-in to building your ambition, building yourself so you can build mutually beneficial relationships. With that in mind, let's discuss a few ways to build relationships. Most of these tips are for building business relationships, building contacts, fostering good working relationships with colleagues, vendors, prospects, future clients, present clients, and past clients. However, remember that we are all people, regardless of our profession, and many of these tips work well for building other relationships too. Let's start with kindness. How kind should you be? As kind as you possibly can. Who should you be kind to? To everyone you come in contact with, from taxi drivers to hotel clerks, from waitresses to store clerks, from people on the street to people in your office, and people at home. Be kind to everyone. And here's why a kind word goes a long way. Somebody's having a bad day, and you don't know they're having a bad day, but somebody's really feeling bad, and you offer up a kind word. Maybe it's just a friendly hello, how are you? Maybe it's just taking a minute or two to listen to what somebody has to say. But your few words of kindness or your few minutes of attention could turn somebody's day around, might make them feel more worthwhile, cared for. Be generous with your kindness, it'll go a long way. People will remember, whether you know them or not. If you're in a crowded restaurant and you're especially nice to the waiter, guess what? He'll remember you next time you come in, and then guess what will happen? You'll get even better service. When you give kindness, it's not gone, it's invested. It'll come back to you. Kindness, it's so important in every aspect of your life. It's so important in building good relationships with others. Now, here's what else is important, sensitivity. Being touched by the experiences of others, being sensitive to others, understanding the plight of others, opening up your heart and your mind and your attention to address the needs of others, the people you work with, the people you live with, putting yourself in someone else's shoes, seeing if you can understand what's going on in their heart. If there's a problem, you've got to be sensitive enough to ask some questions. Not one question, but many questions. Sometimes you won't even get through to the root of the problem until you've gotten two or three questions deep. Most people won't reveal the problem on the first question. You say, Mary, how are you today? How are things? And she says, well, everything's okay. And you can tell by the way she said it that everything's not okay. And most of us don't want to come right out and say what the real problem is unless two criteria are met. Number one, we're talking to someone we can trust. And number two, we're talking to someone who really cares. So sometimes it takes that second question, maybe a third, and maybe a fourth before trust builds and the person finally understands that you do care. Then they're willing to tell you what's really going on, what's really on their mind. Gosh, that saves so much time. Asking questions up front. Did you ever talk for an hour and then ask a question? Found out that you just wasted the previous hour? Learn to ask questions that will build the trust and communication between you and those you work with. Learn to express, not impress. If you want to touch somebody, express sincerity from the heart. Impress builds a gulf. Express builds a bridge. Identification. You want to be able to relate your thoughts and philosophies and experiences to someone who will say, Me too. I know what you mean. You don't want their reaction to be, so what? If you're meeting someone for the first time, you're simply getting acquainted, making contact. Here's where you start. Find something you have in common. Find something you can both identify with. Start with where they are before you try by taking them where you want them to go. So, if you're trying to talk to somebody who's been stricken in the heart and you've had this experience, you can talk about being stricken in the heart and it'll mean something. It'll have substance. It'll have depth. And if you start there and then start building the bridge, you have identification. 
then you start building rapport. And when you start building rapport with someone, or when you want to enhance the rapport you have with someone, you need effective communication skills. Let me give you a few tips on good communication. Because to be able to get along well with others, to be able to work well with others, to be able to live well with others, you must be a good communicator. Number one, have something worth saying. Interest, fascination, sensitivity, and knowledge. Number two, now that you've got something worth saying, number two is say it well. And you've got to be able to translate it so it'll benefit someone. You must have a good delivery system for your substance and knowledge and awareness and understanding and experience. Learn to say it well. And here are some clues on saying it well. Number one, sincerity. The best communication occurs when both people are sincere. One sincerely wishing to learn or listen, and the other sincerely wishing to share. Number two, in saying it well, is repetition. Part of saying it well is simply practicing to say it well. Practice, practice, practice. Part of what I teach in sales training is practice. Practice, practice. You start with something simple, and when you don't know much about what you're doing, practice is even more important. Let's say you're in sales, and your presentation is not that good, and you wander around saying, you wouldn't want to buy this, would you? I'm telling you, maybe if you say that often enough during the day, somebody might say, well, maybe I would. What are you selling? Now, you can't say, mind your own business. No, once you've opened the door, you've got to go through it. Here's what happens if you practice in sales. You're bound to make sales. Somebody will ask what you're selling, and you'll have to tell them. Maybe they'll want it. You're bound to get better. If you practice, you'll improve your sales presentation, your listening skills with prospects, your ability to close the sale, and your ability to earn a living. Practice is just as valuable as a sale because what's valuable in sales is the skill. A sale will make you a living. Skills will make you a fortune. So, practice your presentation and your ability to communicate what you know. Even those who say, no, I'm not interested, are valuable because they allow you to practice your presentation. Especially when you're just starting out, you might even consider paying them to listen to you practice. Be thankful for the, no's. Practice helps you develop skills, and skills make your labor more valuable. If you just sell, you can make a living. If you skillfully sell, you can make a fortune. If you just talk, you can hold a family together. If you skillfully talk, you can build dreams and a future. The difference is skill. You can cut a tree down with a hammer, but it takes about 30 days. If you trade the hammer for an axe, you can cut the tree down in about 30 minutes. The difference between 30 minutes and 30 days is the tool. Your best communication tool is your skill, so practice to get the skill of saying it well. Part of saying it well is sincerity, the next part is repetition. Here's another part of saying it well, brevity. Sometimes you don't need much, just enough. The more you know, the briefer you can be because you can make words more effective. Jesus was brief when he was putting his team together. He just wandered around the countryside, and every once in a while, he'd see someone he wanted on his team and said, You, follow me. That's short, that's brief. Why could Jesus be so brief and yet so effective? For all that he was, he didn't have to say much. When you become bigger, when you become stronger, you become a person of better reputation. When you arrive, your reputation may precede you, so you don't have to say much. If your reputation has preceded you, it will do a lot of the job for you before you even arrive. Next is style. Part of saying it well is style. Be a student of style, a variety of styles, then make sure you develop your own. Be a student but develop your own. Don't be someone else. Let someone else influence you, but don't become them. Develop your own style. Here's another tip on saying it well. Vocabulary. You've got to have a good vocabulary to say it well. We can only translate for others with the tools called vocabulary. If you're lacking in vocabulary, then you're lacking in tools to describe some problem or some answer. Words are essential. You can't communicate well without a defined vocabulary. Every time you come across a word that's new to you, look it up. Every time you're in a conversation and the other person uses a word that's new to you, look it up. Most of the time, you can figure out the meaning of a new word by how it's used, but if you can't, make sure you hold your response until you know for sure.
Several years ago, some of my friends took a survey among prisoners as part of a rehabilitation program they were working on. They weren't looking for this, but here's what they found. There's a definite relationship between vocabulary and behavior. The more limited the vocabulary, the more the tendency toward poor behavior. When you stop to think about it, it makes sense. Vocabulary is a way of seeing. It gives us insight. Only with your present vocabulary can you see. You can't use tools you don't have to create understanding, awareness, comprehension, perception, and vision. You can only have as much vision as your present vocabulary will give you. If you're limited in vocabulary, then you can't see very well. What if a person could only see the world through a little tiny hole? Can you imagine the mistakes they make in judgment? He'd say, here's how it is. You'd say, no, that's not how it is. Here's how it is. The guy says, but I can't see it. How come he can't see it? He doesn't have the vocabulary to understand the translation. Vocabulary is also what we use as a tool to express what's going on in our heart and head, to translate our questions, answers, and perceptions. If you have a limited way of translating and expressing what's going on in your heart and head, you'll fall way behind. You'd have twin problems without a good vocabulary. Number one, you wouldn't be able to see. Number two, you wouldn't be able to express. Your world would keep getting smaller and smaller, not having the vision or the tools. Finally, you wouldn't need a place much bigger than 10 by 12 to live. Why? That's about as big as some people's world is. That's all they've got, this little narrow world, making mistakes every day because they can't see, getting it wrong every day because they can't comprehend or understand. No tools with which to translate. For good communication, number one is having something good to say. Number two is saying it well. And number three is reading your audience. You've got to read what's going on between you and the people you're talking to. Should you say what you're saying a little softer? Should you say it a little stronger? Should you explain it more? Should you be more clear and concise? Should you quit? A lot of the decision making that's going on during the conversation depends on how well you can read and tell what's going on in the minds of those you're trying to reach. It doesn't matter if you're looking into the face of a child, the face of a colleague, or a thousand faces in an audience. You've got to read what's going on. You've got to pay attention. So let me give you some ways to read your audience. The first one is to read what you see. Search the face of a child and see if you're coming across. See if they look perplexed. See if they're getting it, or if they can't get it. Body language tells us a lot. Look at how the people you're talking to are sitting, what they are doing with their hands, their eyes. If a guy's got his arms crossed, legs crossed, chin tucked down, and is frowning, You've got your work cut out for you. This guy is not going to be easy to reach. If a lady is standing up from behind her desk, you've got to hurry. She's not going to listen to much more. You've probably got to pick up the pace and get down to it. So, the first one is to read what you see. The second one is to read what you hear. You've got to be a good listener to be a good communicator. Get some feedback. Listen to be a good parent. To talk well, you've got to listen well. That's so valuable. Get the feedback. What you hear may help you change gears. Be a little stronger. Be a little softer. Find a different illustration if this one isn't working. Search for another way to say it. Become sensitive to someone else's words, not just by preparing to talk when the other person is through. Listen and pick up those signals that the feedback of words gives us. Now, here's the third way to read your audience, and that is to read how you feel. Emotional signals. You've got to learn to pick those up. Pick up those feelings. Women just seem to have this part built in. Men can learn it, but women have it. A woman says, it doesn't feel right, it just doesn't feel right. A man says, what does that mean, it doesn't feel right? He says, it's something. He says, something? Something what? She says, I'm telling you, something doesn't feel right. Now, men can learn it, but women have it. Learn to read your emotions. Learn to read what others are feeling so you can adjust your communication, so you can adjust your approach, so you can get your message across, so you can communicate well. Communication is having something to say and saying it well. Communication is one of the key ingredients in being able to work well with others, in being able to build our ambition by working well with others. Time is more valuable than money. You can acquire more money, but you cannot acquire more time. So, guard your seeds, your money, and your time. 
Plan your time carefully and don't allow anyone to waste it. It's acceptable to allow people to take up a little of your free time, but don't let them take your important time. Be vigilant against anything that might steal your time. Remember, work smarter, not harder. During my time in South Africa, I learned a saying by Arnold Bennett about time. I won't have time to write it all down, but I'll read it to you, and it'll be included in the set of cassettes you're receiving for the weekend. Arnold Bennett said, Time is the raw material of everything. With it, all is possible. Without it, nothing. The supply of time is a daily miracle, genuinely astonishing. Think about it. Every morning, you wake up with 24 hours to spend. It's yours, the most precious thing you have. No one can take it from you, and everyone gets the same amount. Time doesn't care how much money you have or how smart you are. You can't save time for later, and you can't borrow from the future. You can only use the time you have right now. If you don't use your time well, you waste your life. Time doesn't come back, so it's important to make the most of it. How you spend your time affects your happiness. If you can't fit everything into your day, your life can get messed up. We all have the same amount of time, so it's up to us to use it wisely. My father lived to be 90 years old, but it seemed short in his seemingly long life of 93 years. It was short because it just seems like if we only had more time. The Old Testament gives us a view of some people who lived to be 5, 6, 7, 8, 900 years old. If I had a chance to ask, I would ask how come we got short change. Wouldn't that be a good question if you had a chance to ask? Imagine seven, eight, nine hundred years to watch generation after generation after generation after generation stay healthy and well. I mean, you've got to be healthy to make it to nine hundred. You've got to take your vitamins. I'm not pushing the Bible. I'm not pushing vitamins. I'm doing good today. So, the key is time is precious. Now, let me give you Bill Bailey's description of time. Life is not just the passing of time. Life is a collection of experiences, their frequency, and their intensity. Life is not just watching the clock tick away. Life is a collection of experiences, their intensity, their frequency. When my friend Mark died at age 44, someone says, that's young to die. But what if you lived four lifetimes in one? Might not be too young. So, whatever the span of your life turns out to be, here's what you want to fill it up with. Experiences and the intensity of those experiences. All right, let's talk about time management. When should you start your day? The answer is as soon as it's finished. Plan your day well, leaving room for surprises. But once you've planned for a productive day, start right away. Your time becomes much more valuable this way. Don't wait around to start your day. Next, don't start your week until you've got it all planned out. Planning a whole week can be tough, but it's worth it. And don't start your month until you finish planning it. Think about where you need to go, who you need to see, and what you need to accomplish. Now, here's the big one. Don't start your year until you've planned it out as best you can. You can't plan it minute by minute, but think about what you want to achieve over the whole year. January 1st might come, and things might change, but if you've made progress in the first 90 days, you'll multiply your success. I've experienced this myself. After three months, I'm rolling, making so much progress that I revise my whole plan for the year. But before answering the question of how to manage your time effectively, let me give you just a few tips on time management essentials. First of all, you run the day, or it runs you. It's pretty simple when you look at it. Starting something isn't hard, but after a while, it starts to control you. I once told my team, it's like giving birth to a tiger. Starting it is one thing, but learning how to handle it is another. Days are expensive. When you spend a day, you have one less day to spend, so make sure you spend each one wisely. Think about it. You've committed enough time to work already. If you're putting in 8 to 10 hours a day, that's plenty. Sure. There are times when you need to work longer hours, maybe 12, 14, or even 16 hour bursts. We've all been there, putting in the extra time. But eventually, you have to find balance, your health, your heart, your blood pressure, they're all in risk if you don't. You don't necessarily need to work more hours, you just need to use your time better. As the saying goes, it's not about the hours you spend, but what you accomplish in those hours that matters. Also, you need clear goals written down. Time management is crucial. If you don't have a list of goals, we'll work on that tomorrow. 
Prioritize and keep reviewing your goals because that's how you decide where to focus your time. You need a plan to achieve your goals. Another important thing is to separate what's important from what's not. Spend your time on the things that really matter. That's why it's important to think on paper. Write down your game plan to make sure you're not spending too much time on minor things. Remember, don't confuse being busy with achieving something. It's easy to keep busy, but make sure you're busy with the right things. Next, concentration is key. Being distracted can be dangerous, whether you're on the road or in business. You need to keep your mind focused. I have a little rule. Don't start your business day until you're at the office. I used to begin my day in the shower or at the breakfast table, and it caused a lot of problems. Sitting at breakfast, my mind was already at the office. I even found myself mixed up when trying to relax at the beach. My mind kept wandering back to work. That's being mixed up. We talked about this quote in the evening seminar. Wherever you are, be there. If you're at the breakfast table, be present. When you're talking with someone, be fully engaged. On your way to work, enjoy the journey. Look around, observe what's happening, be in the moment. Then, when you're at the office, focus on your tasks. Another essential in time management is learning to say no. It's easy to fill up your schedule and end up with all sorts of problems simply because you couldn't say no when you should have. It's much harder to say yes and then try to back out later. Better to say no up front than to overload yourself. As Ron Reynolds says, don't let your mouth overload your back. The third essential is to analyze yourself honestly and then either make adjustments or find someone else to handle tasks that you're not good at. For example, my staff discovered that I'm not a good courier. They gave me a check to deliver, but it ended up getting lost. I promised I'd do better next time, but it just didn't work out. So, we made a rule in our office. Don't give the chairman anything to deliver. It won't arrive. I had to accept that I wasn't good at certain tasks. Instead of promising to change, I found someone else to handle them. I hired someone to take care of reading financial statements and handling corporate matters that I kept putting off. It cost me a lot in fines and taxes until I finally got someone to handle it for me. Miss Mary, a legal secretary with a real estate license, was a lifesaver. He handled my finances, argued with attorneys, and dealt with the IRS. She did such a good job that she saved me from paying an extra $15,000 in taxes one year. I even gave her a bonus for her excellent work. If you're not going to change, then find someone who can do it for you. Analyze your strengths and weaknesses. If you're good at bookkeeping, great, keep doing it. But if not, don't keep promising to change. Instead, find someone who can handle it for you, even if it means paying them a small fee. It's better than promising to do something and never following through. So, analyze yourself honestly, it's crucial. The last essential is to be more alert. This means not only staying aware of what's happening around you, but also examining your current procedures. You might have outdated methods that are wasting time. Maybe you've been doing something the same way for five years when there's a quicker, more efficient way to do it, like using computer programs or updated tools. It's easy to accumulate wasted time and motion by sticking to old methods. So, take a look at your procedures and see if there are any improvements you can make. And be alert to time-wasting activities. For example, in sales management, it's taught not to travel across town until you've explored opportunities closer by. Going 40 miles for a prospect might not be worth the time when there are prospects nearby. Lastly, ask questions. When you're about to talk to someone, ask questions to understand their situation better. This can save you a lot of time. People often don't disclose the real problem at first, so asking questions helps you get to the heart of the matter quickly. And don't just stop at one or two questions. Keep asking until you're sure you understand the situation. Having game plans is crucial too, whether it's for the next six months or a year. Laying out your plans helps ensure things get done. This is especially important for businesses with international operations or multiple corporations. Thinking on paper is key to effective time management. If there's one thing to take away about time management, it's the importance of having clear plans laid out. So, how to manage your time effectively? First, ignore the subject. I mean, that's good advice. Don't let anything overly bug you because, remember, now you don't have to do anything. 
So, if I got to get a handle on my time, the answer is no. You don't. If you want to let it all go, you can let it all go. I mean, this is good advice. Somebody says you ought to jot this down. Ignore all the you oughts, or you shoulds, only if they're giving general information. It's better to say, if you're teaching, we should, instead of, you should. Then you let me listen in without it being too confrontational. If everyone did this, see, that'd be great. And then you give a person a chance to choose to do it or not to do it. But when you start the, use, you are. Now see, if I don't, now we've got some tension and maybe some problems. You seem to always create problems when you're talking to your kids. You say, if kids would do this, not always saying, if you did this, if you did this, life would be better, but if kids did this, life would be better. It's like making a little talk and letting them listen in, and then it's a little less confrontational. It gives us a choice. In one of my seminars, here's what I teach. All life forms strive to the max of its potential, except human beings. All life forms strive to the max of its potential, except human beings. How tall will a tree grow? As tall as it possibly can. You've never heard of a tree growing half as high as it could. No, trees don't grow half. A tree drives its roots as deep as it can, reaches as high as it can, produces every leaf it can, every fruit it possibly can, to the max. Every life form strives to the max, except human beings. Now, why not human beings? Jot this down. You've been given the dignity of choice. You're not a robot. You don't have to repeat this year the same as last year. You can tear up last year's plan, develop a new plan. So, the dignity of being a human being. Now, here's the choice of being a human being. To be part of all we were meant to be, or to strive for all, or half, or part, or some. The choice is up to you. To develop one skill or ten skills. So, this is, well, I'd be happy with just one more language. Well, some say, well, hey, I'm going to learn six or seven. And this is all a matter of choice. And when someone says, no, you ought to learn four, you've got to resist all that because this is personal dignity, and you don't want to destroy someone's dignity by doing all the A, S, and they feel reluctant to do it. Now, we've got problems. So, if you want to just ignore this subject on time management. Second, step down to something easier. The guy's in sales, and he says, oh, I want to own the company. Finally, he owns the company. Now, he's got no time to play golf. He said, when I was in sales, I was making big money playing golf three days a week. Heck with this owning something. Heck with managing. My life was never my own after I started to manage. I'm going back to sales. T, this is the key. If you're getting too pressed, you might consider stepping down to something with a little easier time pressure. The little girl says to her mother, Daddy comes home, brings his briefcase, and pats me on the head and says, Hello, disappears, and works on these papers. How come my daddy doesn't play with me? And her mother said, Look, your daddy loves you very much, but he's so busy at work, he can't get it all done. He has to bring it home. He loves you, but that's why he can't play with you. And the little girl said, Why don't they just put him in a slower group? If you don't have time for your kids, you might consider joining a slower group. Remember when I said, some things I went for cost me too much. So, reconsider. Next, the key to time management. That's worked longer and harder. But see, there's a limit to that. I almost lost my health the first year. I went so crazy about personal development and achievement. I just went bonkers. You know, I told you I was skinny, but by the end of that first year, I was a walking shadow. And then it suddenly occurred to me, what if I got rich and too ill to spend it? I mean, that was a shocker. So, I started developing a little more reasonably because I said, if 12 hours won't do it, I'll work 14. If that won't do it, I'll work 18. I mean, however many hours it takes. And sure enough, it cost me too much. So, see, working longer and harder, for some, might be appropriate. You know, if you're just sitting around not doing that much, this might be good. Work longer and harder, but you can only work so hard. Here's the key. Not to work harder, but smarter. When you've worked as hard as you can, doing the best you can in terms of physical output, in a reasonable time, 
The ultimate in the management of time is you simply become more skillful. When I first got into sales, you know, I was around people that could get, you know, 9 out of 10, and 8 out of 10. And when I first started, I could only get 1 out of 10. But here's what I did. I worked around the clock, around the clock, so that I would make up in numbers what I lacked in skill. That's good in sales. You've got to jot that down. When you're new, you make up in numbers what you lack in skill. Now, when you become more skillful, the numbers can go down because now your persuasive ability and all of that is so high that you don't need to put as many numbers out. But at first, if you want to compete or if you want to really get good, you've got to put in the numbers. But if you get more from yourself, develop more of yourself, now the time management becomes an easier task. The most important time management is when you work, work. When you play, play. Don't mix the two. Don't work at play. I used to take my family to the beach, and I would bring my briefcase. I learned not to do that at the beach. I'm saying I should be at the office. I should be at the office. Now, my family's upset because I'm at the beach, and I'm thinking office, office, office. Now, when I'm at the office, I'm thinking, what I got to get my family to the beach? The beach, the beach. So, things are not going too well at the office because I'm thinking beach. And things are not going too well at the beach because I'm thinking office. Here's what I learned to do. At the beach. Be at the beach. At the office. Be at the office. When you work, work. When you play, play. Don't mix the two. Don't work at play and don't play at work. Work is too serious. You don't want the reputation of being the office joker. It's not a good one. Yes, there's time for some pleasant stories. Yes, there's time for a little humor. Yes, best if it's a happy office, of course. But I'm telling you, you've got to be serious about work because you're parting with a piece of your life for the work you do. Your work costs you a piece of your life. Here's what it's called. Serious business. Not grim, not unhappy, but serious. T. Don't play at work. The only person I don't think we use anymore. Horse around at the office, play around, play jokes, play tricks. No place. Not at the workplace. At the beach, yes. At the bar, yes. Somewhere else, not work. You've got to treat work with all due conservative passion because it's leading you to your future. All work is good. You may not like your job, but if it's the stepping stones to get you to where you want to go, you've got to appreciate your job. You don't have to have a passion for your job. Here's the ultimate passion. A passion for incredible success in every department of my life. That's the passion. But don't look down on some menial job you have to do to finally get you to where you want to go. No job is menial. Every job is noble. Training life for pay. Making a contribution to society. So, it's important for everyone to understand how valuable time is, prioritize what they do, and try to make the most of each moment. This way, we can live a more meaningful and fulfilling life reaching our full potential and leaving a positive impact for the future. In conclusion, effective time management is essential for success in both personal and professional life. By implementing the key principles discussed, such as prioritization, focus, delegation, and staying alert, you can make the most out of your time and achieve your goals more efficiently. Remember to analyze your current practices regularly and be willing to make adjustments to improve efficiency. Asking questions, making plans, and writing things down can all help you stay organized and save time. Managing your time isn't just about doing more. It's about feeling less stressed and having a better balance in life. So, take control of your time, be proactive, and watch as things start falling into place. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand before you today to share some of the most valuable lessons I have learned on the psychology of money. Money, my friends, is not just a means of transacting goods and services. It is a powerful force that shapes our lives, our choices, and our destinies. Lesson number one. Money is a magnifier. It has the ability to amplify both the best and the worst in us. If you are a generous person, money will magnify your generosity and enable you to make an even greater positive impact on the world. On the other hand, if you are a selfish and greedy individual, Money will only deepen those negative traits within you. Therefore, it is crucial that we develop a healthy relationship with money. We must strive to use it as a force for good, as a tool to create a better life for ourselves and those around us. 
Let us not fall into the trap of believing that money will bring us happiness in and of itself. Instead, let us recognize it as a means to create a life of fulfillment, contribution, and abundance. Lesson number two. Money follows value. In a world driven by commerce, it is easy to become obsessed with the pursuit of money itself. We see the allure of wealth and success all around us, and we can be tempted to chase after money as an end goal. But let us not forget that money is merely a reflection of the value we create in the lives of others. If you want to earn more money, you must be willing to provide more value to the world. Drive to make a positive difference in the lives of others. Focus on solving real problems, meeting genuine needs, and serving others with excellence. As you do so, money will naturally flow into your life as a byproduct of your contribution. Lesson number three. Money is a tool, not a master. Many of us have been conditioned to believe that our worth as individuals is tied to the amount of money we possess. But let us not forget that money is nothing more than a tool, a means to an end. Do not make the mistake of allowing money to become the master of your life. Instead, become the master of money. Use it intelligently, purposefully, and ethically to create the life you desire. Do not let the pursuit of money consume you or blind you to the beauty and richness of life that exists beyond material possessions. Lesson number four. Wealth is a mindset. True wealth is not solely measured in monetary terms, but also in the quality of our thoughts, our relationships, and our experiences. It is a mindset that transcends mere financial abundance and encompasses a holistic approach to life. Wealth is about living with purpose, passion, and fulfillment in all areas of our existence. Therefore, let us dare to redefine our understanding of wealth. Let us recognize that true prosperity comes from within and manifests itself in all aspects of our lives. Cultivate a wealth mindset by nourishing your mind, body, and soul, surrounding yourself with positive influences, setting meaningful goals, and pursuing personal growth with unwavering commitment. Lesson number five. Money is a reflection of self-worth. Money, in its simplest form, is a reflection of the value we place upon ourselves. If we do not believe that we are deserving of wealth and abundance, it will elude us. Conversely, if we cultivate a deep sense of self-worth, money will flow into our lives effortlessly. Therefore, I implore you to embark on a journey of self-discovery and self-empowerment. Examine your beliefs about money and abundance, Uncover any limiting beliefs that might be holding you back from achieving financial success, and replace those beliefs with empowering thoughts and affirmations that reinforce your worthiness for abundance. My dear friends, I hope these lessons on the psychology of money have ignited a spark within you, a spark of curiosity, of self-reflection, and of transformation. The road to financial success is not an easy one, but it is a journey well worth undertaking. As we continue our expedition into the realm of personal development in part two, may you find the courage to confront your fears, embrace your potential, and create a life of abundance and fulfillment. Remember, the key to unlocking your financial potential lies within you. Believe in yourself, invest in your personal growth, and the world will respond in kind. I am confident that each and every one of you is capable of achieving greatness, not just in the realm of money, but in all aspects of life. Embrace the power of the psychology of money and let it propel you towards a future filled with prosperity, joy, and purpose.